Hey guys, it is Adam with uh, Live with a Storyteller. Um, just introduce myself real quickly. My name is Adam Gersten, and um, I run a company called LG Nexus. We're basically a social media platform for all gamers. But um, what we're trying to do is we're trying to talk and reach out to LARPers and people that tell stories and try to kind of give them a new way to see uh, things when it comes to LARPing and, and getting involved in all different types of um, uh, gaming. So what we're actually doing here tonight is we're going to be talking to a gentleman and he's been in LARPing and, and more than that, uh, storytelling for, for decades, for, for a long time. I don't want to date him too much, but um, we're, we're really excited to bring him on. And so let me just tell you a little more about what we're trying to do with the show. We just want to help uh, older gamers kind of reminisce about some of the, the LARPing experiences they might have had when they were younger. We want to bring newer people that are kind of curious around the fence about LARPing and have them kind of learn and kind of see that, you know, it's it's not scary. There's real people, they have a lot of fun, um, you know, that people are welcoming, accepting, and, you know, people have kind of been through just, you know, different things. And so this is our pilot episode. So, you know, please kind of bear with us. Um, but what I would uh, really like you guys to do is to, uh, we're gonna kind of roll the little intro for Mr. Sean Mohall, and uh, we're gonna bring him on in just one second. Here we go, check out this video. Hello, Mr. Sean Mulhall. How are you doing today? I am doing excellent. How are you doing today? I'm doing great. Today's been a great day. Um, and I just wanted to uh, um, thank you again for coming on to this kind of new thing that we're trying out that's, you know, live with a storyteller. Um, everybody, you know, I uh, hope that you guys kind of check this out. One of the things is that um, you'll be able to uh, ask questions and we'll kind of fit them in as, as we go. Okay. But um, to kind of let's just get started and kind of get involved and you know sean let me ask you this you know how long have you been been larping for december 1991 wow yeah so it's been a pretty long time mm -hmm. and i just also wanted to say thanks for having me on um uh especially on the inaugural episode i think that's pretty cool so thank you well, you know, I've heard a lot of your stories, you know, to, you know, we've known each other for over 20 years kind of doing this and you're by far one of the best storytellers that I know. Oh, and um, so I just wanted to kind of start off with a bang and it, it wasn't just me, uh, some of the other people that I was throwing this idea around, they also said they like, you have to be on the first show. Oh, all right. Well, I appreciate that. It's, uh, it's always very, um, it's always very humbling to hear that people I, you know, they enjoy the stories that I've created. They've enjoy uh, participating in uh, what I've offered, right? As well as uh, it's always very humbling to that people actually like my actually verbose storytelling style also. So, well, uh, that's absolutely true. Uh, I myself, I've actually been on numerous numbers of your stories through through LARPing and even in D&D &D games and stuff like that. And I've always enjoyed it. Oh, and thank you. so, um, let me, you know, how'd you get started in, in, in LARPing and telling stories kind of, you know, kind of. Okay. Um, it's, it's like going way down memory's path here. Uh, the, the tree of memory, so to speak. Um, it actually started when I was in high school. Um, I was, uh, hanging around, um, some new friends of mine. I had gone to a new school. I was in uh, 10th grade. And I had gone to a new school and um, in that 10th, between that 10th grade and that 11th grade year, uh, I had met uh, what I would qualify now as the gamer community. And uh, there were a bunch of people and I really, I really didn't play a lot besides video games. I really didn't play like Dungeons and Dragons. You know, I, I always knew what Dungeons and Dragons was. Um, I had, um, I had an older brother. And my older brother was into Dungeons and Dragons and he's 10 years older than I am. So I would read his monster manual books and things like that. in the when I was a kid in the back of the card and that kind of spurred of love of mythology. And uh, next thing you know, I'm checking out all the mythological books on uh, Greek mythology in the library and things like that. Cause I read a lot as a kid or I still do, but I, that was kind of one of my passions. And um, next thing you know, uh, you know, I'm running into some people in my high school years that are really into gaming and it was just kind of a natural evolution fit. And they're all like, Hey, we got this really cool thing. And I, what's funny about this is nobody ever even said the word it's called LARPing, 
or anything like that. That's not how it really kind of started. Um, I was in this uh, friend's car and he said, hey, um, reach into the back seat and pull those out. And I'm like, pull what? And I reached in the back seat and there are two LARP swords, buffer weapons. And we were headed over to another friend of ours house who I really didn't know well, but um, he's like, here, just arm yourself. And I'm like, I, I don't understand what's going on here at all. <laughs> and uh, we get to the guy's house, but we park like kind of up the street. And he's like, okay, his parents aren't home, but we got to kind of sneak. And I'm like, is this safe? You know, what's what's kind of going on here? I'm, this is sounds sketchy. He's like, no, no, it's okay. It's okay. And so um, we sneak up and I've got this and it's it's basically PVC pipe. Right. With foam over it that's been taped. And um, it's kind of, you know, back in those days, it was heavier. Right. Sure. So it's, it's kind of heavy in my hands and everything like that. But it's a sword, you know. And, you know, I was as a kid. I always had, um, you know, sticks and stuff that I'd sword fight with and things like that. So it was just kind of a natural, yeah, okay. And um, so we get out there and we get to his house and we're sneaking up. And he's, he's this guy jumps out of the bushes in a full ninja costume, right? <laughs> I kid you not. He's completely ninja up. And he's got a, a you know, a, 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 a sword in his hand also. And he attacks and attacks me. And I'm like, oh, gosh. Right. And so I'm, you know, trying to fend him off and everything like that. And during the, the fight, his sword breaks. OK. Mm -hmm. And I didn't know it. And um, his sword breaks. And this is the first time anybody's ever swung a boffer at me in any way, shape or form. And as his sword breaks, he comes back down like this with a straight going down and it hits me right here with jagged PVC. No. Okay. And it cuts me right open. I got this scar. If I didn't have this mustache here or part of my beard, you would see a scar there that I have to this day where he opened up my face right there after his sword broke after hitting my thing. But and it, it, you know, it kind of hurt or whatever, but I was much more like, this is the craziest thing ever, you know? And after that, some friends were like, oh yeah, there's this whole LARPing thing. And, um, you know, you got to try it out. It's really cool and everything like that. And I was like, okay. So the local LARP in our area, um, it opened, uh, it was Nero back in those days and, uh, before it changed its name. And, um, it had a newbie day, right? That was for fifth level characters and below. Okay. Or actually it was like fourth level, 4 4.9 level characters and below, I think is what it was. And uh, so I went out with some friends. All right. And uh, it was, uh, and that same friend who had taken me over to, um, over to our friend's house where I got cut. Uh, he had had one other like sparring session with me. And uh, then we went to that uh, we went to that state park and uh, was um, uh, I, I got there. There were a lot of people there. I'm expecting to be around my friend. And he's like, OK, well, good luck. And then, boom, he's gone. And he went he found another friend and just took off. And so I'm sitting there in the middle of town, not having any clue what I'm supposed to be doing. Right. Like because here's the thing. I didn't even have a rule book. Right. I didn't have I, there was no real Internet besides bulletin board systems back in that day. Right. So there was no way to really look and see how to play the game besides what I'd been told by him. You know, OK, you, it was a cumulative damage system. So you call damage. You can take so much damage. You fall down. You know, you bleed to death. And stuff. OK, all right. So I'm there and some guy comes up behind me. Not, I kid you not. I'm six minutes into the event. And some some guy comes in and just bam waylays me another player and, wow. steal, and steals my starting newbie money <laughs> and it was like this is an this is a very inglorious start to my uh, larping career and uh after that i just i got my money stolen and i was asleep for 10 minutes in the middle of town nobody he just stepped over me right like okay newbie like whatever so um did you get any of your other that, friends what's that now did you get any of your any of the friends that you went with as well oh, no no they'd left they hmm. went on a module like immediately got to that game and they went on a module so i was by myself oh 
So I did what I encourage everybody to do that comes to a LARP for the first time. And that is I went to go find Monster Town. And once I found Monster Town, I monstered the rest of the event. And I learned more about playing a LARP during you know from that from the rest of the day just doing that than i ever did you know looking at anything or being told anything by anybody else so do you think that's like one of the first things like someone that's new to a game should do is just like learn the game as well i absolutely absolutely and it just you get um you get a conception of it in your in your head about what is this really about and you know what you're going to do and and plans and all these kind of things and you got other people around you you know chances are if you're going out to a larp you've been told about a larp from somebody else right uh, you know you might run in you might run into it now these days there's movies that have LARPing in them and things like that. So you might have a little bit better idea of what it is, say, back than we did in the old days. But um, chances are most people go out to LARPs that already had know somebody who's already LARPing. You know, I'd say that's probably 85% of the people that probably go out to a LARP. Um, and uh, they've probably been told a lot and everything like that. And if you have somebody that you can, um, you know, lean on while you're there that can help you with that, that's always really good. But I think you really learn more about playing the game when you go out and you volunteer your time and you can observe what people are doing. Uh, you see the players, the other players. You go out there, you play monsters, you get comfortable with the idea that, hey, somebody's swinging something at me, right? And there's a lot of people that don't know really how to deal with that. You know, it's a new thing. Like somebody's trying to hit me with something, you know, and um, that's a thing you got to get used to. You got to get adjusted to the fact that there's this physical component that's going on or somebody's rearing back and trying to hit me with uh, with this packet. OK, is another thing. And um, depending on the type of LARP you play. And, you know, when that happens, you know, all your old dodgeball skills hopefully come into play and you can get out the way or whatnot. But, um, you know, it's a it's a real it's a real learning curve there at first. But the thing is, is you get hooked. Right. And I was man, even though I went out and I, you know, totally just, you know, my first disastrous attempt at LARPing, I was waylaid and my newbie money was stolen and and everything like that and then even getting to monster town because i didn't know quite where monster town was in this park so i ran into all kinds of monsters on the way to monster town not knowing that i could be out of play and i got chased through the woods by these and i thought these guys looked like they were from guar i kid you not right? they've got spikes all over their armor one of them had a big hammer and he hit the bridge that was that I was about to cross in this park and the whole bridge shuddered and he screams at me and he goes fresh meat <laughs> and I ran I ran like nobody else's business I don't know if I've ever ran so fast in my life and um and what's funny is when I got to monster town and I told some people about it in monster town the monster marshal there was like oh yeah those are just goblins <laughs> I'm like, what? You know, those are goblins that are dressed like Guar, the scariest looking guys I've ever seen in my life. You know, okay. Wow. So it was just crazy. But I, I made it to Monster Town, and the rest of the day, I spent learning how to, what this actual game was. And just like with any game, there's a there's a learning curve. You got to figure it out and things like that. And, you know, now games do a pretty good um, job of the, the, the games that I've been to, and that I've helped run do a pretty good job of offering a newbie training course at the beginning of the game. So you're less likely, and it's like a little module you go on and they teach you how to do certain things. It's kind of like um, when you're playing a video game and it's a tutorial, right? Sure. And so you kind of get a, Oh, whereas if you're playing a video game and it's like, this is how I jump, this is how I block, this is how I do this. This is more like, this is what you do. This is how you play the game. This is what out of game means versus in game, you know, and concepts like that. And this is what hold means. And, you know, if anybody gets hurt, you know, we call a hold and that's an important rule. And this is what we mean. And I spent a number of years actually teaching those newbie courses. This is how to be safe versus not be safe because the intention is not to go out there and actually hurt anybody 
or do anything like that. And most LARPs aren't full contact LARPs. There's a couple that are out there that are much more oriented towards the combat side of it. But a lot of LARPs, I'd say the majority of them probably lean somewhere in the middle these days, which is they want a good structure of narrative and gameplay to go along with the physical component of combat and things like that in it. And um, when you're making a LARP today, there's a, a big move that you want to be able for people to make characters that don't even have to go into combat to be successful LARP characters, right? Or successful in the sense of they have a good time. And so, um, and that's, that's kind of a big, that's kind of a big deviation from the way things, how, how things have evolved from back in those days when I was first starting. Yeah. That makes sense. Um, so, you know, when you first got started, you get, a, you had some sort of concept for a character. Mm -hmm. um, is that something that kind of, you know, where did that come from and how did that evolve kind of as you've, as you played? So... <laughs> when I first started, I actually really didn't have a good concept for a character. I really, didn't even, I really didn't even know, but see, things have changed a lot, right? Uh, back then, I really didn't even know. Um, I had read some books and things like that, um, but I really didn't even know um, – what was a good idea? Uh, like I was playing like a barbarian originally or something like that. Uh, I went through about my first LARPs, my first LARPing experiences. I went through about three events before I finally figured out what it was that was happening in the game that I wanted to do. Right. Okay. And part of that is you get out and you may think I'm going to go out and I'm just going to, you know, kick everybody's ass. Right. And I got a sword and a shield and da da da. And then you get out there and you run into people who are really good. And you go, wait a second, maybe that's a bad idea. One of the things I realized when I was young was um, it's like fencing in a certain way. LARP, um, LARP style of fighting uses a lot of wrist. OK, yep. and um, if your wrists aren't really strong, or you really haven't been using those muscles in your wrist like that. Um, you get real sore wrists real easy. And uh, so I kind of figured and that was happening to me. So I was like, well, I like combat and I like fighting, but. Yep. Um, this whole thing, spell casting with spell packets and stuff like that, I think I could be more effective doing that. And so I kind of changed and went over to um, what they would call a Templar back in those days, which was a, a mage. It's basically a fighting mage. And because uh, I kind of wanted to do both. And um, so that's kind of what I settled on. But I didn't have like a I didn't have a real good grasp on how to make a character that was not me, so to speak. You know what I'm saying? Um, it was more just kind of an extension of who I was. And that's, and that's normal. That's kind of normal for people when they go to one of these things and they really don't know what they're doing. Um, you know, people are like, well, this is role playing. And you're like role playing. What, what kind of is that? And I had some experience in it with playing some Dungeons and Dragons and things like that. But I really wasn't back in those days. I really wasn't clued into the whole idea of what role playing really was. Um, and it's it's really just another form of acting. And um, when you when you do when you make a character, a lot of times you decide on you know especially these days you go these are the things my character will do these are the things my character won't do and you create a code you create a kind of a you know maybe old D&D terms and alignment for your character things along those lines about how you're going to react and then you create a backstory and you bring you flesh that character to life these none of this stuff was anything I did back in the old days I had to learn kind of how to do that and I also had to learn how rewarding that is and today what I would what I would tell people is, you know, just who's your favorite characters from your favorite books? Who's your favorite characters from your favorite television series or something along those lines? If you are having trouble trying to figure out who your character is or what they should be, get a baseline first. And that baseline usually is something you're familiar with, which is something from another media sort of uh, um, uh, another piece of media. And when you do that, um, you kind of get an idea of, okay, is this guy a good guy? Is he a bad guy? You know, because a lot of times in, in our LARPs, you can be whatever, you know, now there's consequences, of course, if you're going to try to be a bad guy and things like that, but you make up the personality of that character. And if you're going to be a jerk to people, you have to expect people are probably not going to like you, right? There's consequences for that sort of thing, but you can be what you kind of want to be, you know, as long as it's not, um, 
as long as it's not doesn't cross certain lines, right? You know, uh, too abusive or things like that, especially in today's day and age. So, you know, some of the things that happened when I was starting out never would happen today, right? That right. I can see Definitely. because if, we're a lot more aware of um, behavior that is detrimental to the game itself, and that's the kind of thing we want to, you know kind of shy away from and say no that's not acceptable because you when you run a game you you set the the standards for your community and it starts at the top with the people who own the game and run the game and and filters down and if you have somebody who's running the game as we've seen if you have somebody who's running the game and is not really a person that has high ethical standards right in the first place then that trickles down to the player and the player base becomes more like that also. So uh, it always starts at the top. Right. That's okay. So, um, you know, where do you kind of get ideas from your backstory? And I know when we first got started, you mentioned that you do a good bit of reading. Is, is that kind of where... It's the best thing, actually, right? Um, you know, reading is, is very important. Um, but, you know, a lot of times... You know, the great thing about the age that we live in today is if you want to know something about a particular character or something like that, there's everybody does YouTube videos on everything also or something else and uh, some other media. So there's other ways to find out. But reading was the way that I always embraced. And I said, OK, and it's not just fantasy. Right. You know, there's characters, there's elements that I've taken from, you know, historical characters right? People in history. Uh, there's elements for people's role-playing backstory that I've taken from, um, you know, world-renowned authors, you know, Hemingway, Faulkner, things like that. Um, you know, you get your inspiration. And anybody who's a creative person will tell you this. You get your inspiration for what kind of speaks to you, right? And when you, and the way things speak to you is you got to branch your horizons out and you got to not just one genre, Right. But it's viable for all, you know, anything that you interact with and you think is really cool. And, you know, um, you know, um, I'll give you an example. I, I love Denzel's character from that movie where he's the the guy who's in the post-apocalyptic wasteland. Right. Uh, I, can't, the, I can't believe no a book of Eli book of Eli. That's what it is. I love his character in there. Right. And um, I, his character has a, a very cool faith about him that I really like that is is only ever truly tested once or twice. And he passes those tests. Right. But I really liked that character of his. And so I've had characters that I've kind of based on his belief right that strength of uh of faith that he had and it's not just about religion or anything like that but in anything right that you can have faith in or belief so um you know that's just an example of something that inspired me and when something speaks to you use it right that's what it's there for you know stories have been told since the beginning of mankind you know crawling out of the ocean and starting our first fires storytelling is the way that we have helped each other grow uh as uh human beings since the dawn of time since we first started being human beings Absolutely. and um the the really cool thing is there is that when you look today and you see what makes the most money, well, let's take the Marvel movies, for example. What are those? Those are just stories. Those are just really cool stories that are being told that were already told probably in comic book format, right? And now they're just adapted to a live screen audience, but we're telling those stories again, right? And everybody gets kind of inspired by those stories. You know, you get emotional feelings from those stories. It's art, you know, storytelling is art. And the whole purpose of art is kind of to make us feel and to um, give us an emotional reaction. And that's how you can tell if something's good or not is what's the strong, do you get a strong emotional reaction from it? Or is it just kind of meh, you know, and it doesn't really speak to you. And that can be subjective. You know, something that speaks to one person may not be something that speaks to another. So Absolutely. I mean, that's how we would, you know, carry down traditions and things like that. Um, and they're, I mean, I, but I'm not doing this. I do marketing and they're trying to use stories as much as they can in marketing and sales and stuff like that. It, it, it's definitely a big thing. It's a powerful, powerful tool. 
right? Because stories not only give us lessons to learn from, they not only give us guidelines to follow, but they also, they affect us on emotional levels that, um, that if they speak to us in that way, they inspire, you know, they can, they can bring forth, I mean, just your very strong emotions. And that, from a marketing standpoint, that's good. That's what you want. That's something that sells, you know. And so uh, we have made storytelling, truly storytelling, because that's really what movies, that's what books, that's what, you know, even YouTube stuff that people do. Storytelling is a, an industry in its own right that at its very roots that basically everything else. I mean, for example, I watch a lot of sports, right? And I watch a lot of football, as you know. Yeah. And um, one, is the, one of the things that you see, especially for big football games, they like to do is what's the narrative, right? What's going on? And they love to craft a story around what's happening in the football game. And so, for example, last night in the, the college playoff uh, championship, right, with Georgia mm -hmm. and Alabama, it's all about Stetson Bennett, who's this walk-on two-star who – basically has had all these, you know, people doubting him. He's never been the man, anything like that. And he comes back after a disastrous event last night. I mean, it's like a, it's a Hollywood story, right? He comes back, he has a gut check where he, this horrible thing happens. They score. It looks like, oh gosh, here we go again. But then he brings them back and he scores twice and he buckles down and he digs deep and he finds the resolve within him. And that's the kind of story that people want to see, right? That's the kind of thing. So even in our sports, which is, well, it should be about the two teams that are going out there and they're, they're going against each other and everything like, no, no, storytelling is still part of that too, right? Because that gets people, storytelling is a way to get people emotionally involved in it, right? Mm -hmm. To take some ownership of it in certain ways. And when we have that, it's, and it works out like it did last night, it's incredible. Like I'm, I'm pretty sure that guy is going to be a Disney story in about three or four years. Right. So. Okay. Like the Black <laughs> Friday or some of those other types of movies. Right. Right. I mean, we just had one come out. Uh, you know, Kurt Warner, right? No. Kurt Warner was the oh, uh, Los okay. Angeles. Uh, he was the St. Louis Rams quarterback who mm -hmm. the year before had been stocking groceries on the shelf and got a shot with the St. Louis Rams. And it's a big movie. It's a movie right now that's in the theaters okay. about his story. Right. Again, right. There's the story, right? People want to know what's the narrative, what's the story that's surrounding. And when they have that, people get more emotionally involved. So, like, how emotionally involved have you ever gotten in a LARP? So, LARPs, LARPs, I think, lend towards the most emotional involvement, okay? And then any, then anything else, pretty much. OK. And the reason why I say that is because in a LARP, you're doing it. OK. You are participating in it. It's not just and even more so than don't get me wrong. I've had great D&D &D sessions and things like that sitting at the table. But there's something about the act of actually being out there and doing something right and being part of that story. And the thing about a LARP is it's not just. If you go to a, if you have storytellers who do know what they're doing, right, and they understand what the purpose of a storyteller is in a LARP, it's not just to tell the story you want to tell. It's to present a story that everyone else engages and changes that story so it's everybody's story, okay, mm -hmm. not just one person's story. And, uh, you know, I think in a LARP, it's actually a more powerful storytelling medium than any other storytelling medium. I think agree. And uh, have I been emotionally involved? Many, many times. All going all the way back when, you know, it's different emotions, different things. But, um, you know, there's nothing, there's nothing quite like it that I've ever seen. Um, you know, I, I say this to people sometimes that LARPing is, it's kind of like a simulation of life, 
where you can do things and you can make decisions and stuff like that. And yes, there might be consequences in the game, but you don't suffer permanent consequences, right? Like you would in real life if you made a bad decision or a wrong decision. And role-playing in general, whether it's Dungeons & Dragons, tabletop type games, or uh, LARPing, um, they give us the opportunity to learn how to be better decision makers, okay? Which is one of the reasons why I'm kind of a fan of maybe getting people that are younger in their more teenage years, uh, if the LARP is appropriate for it or the Dungeons or maybe Dungeons and Dragons to teach them how to be better, de- how to make decisions, right? Because that's a whole skill unto itself. Making right. decisions is hard. And when you don't have a lot of experience to, to rely on when it comes to that, then, it, then you make the wrong decision sometimes, right? And you do you make or you don't make a decision at all, which can be really disastrous. So um, I'm a big fan of, of getting younger people involved, if nothing else, than to help them learn how to make critical decisions that affects their character. And I, I'm going to be honest with you, I've had I've had I've DM'd uh, D and D games where I've had teenagers cry right in front of me because they made the wrong decision, and and you know because of they made the wrong decision in something something bad may have happened to their character right, but then you know I have to tell them to kind of pull it back right and say hey look it happens right we all make wrong decisions the thing is you're not going to forget this decision that you made here and hopefully you'll make the, a better decision next time. And it doesn't cost them anything in the real world equivalency to learn that lesson. Sure. And so um, I, I, I absolutely believe LARPs are really good for that as well. I agree. I, I think the the worst thing, the, the worst failure you could ever do is actually not learning from your failure. Oh, yeah. Oh, um, yeah. Well, I say this from time to time, you know, life teaches us lessons. We get lessons to learn. We, life teaches us lessons. And if we don't learn them the first time, the next time it comes up, it's going to be a harder lesson to learn. And it's going to keep happening. And it's going to keep getting harder until we either, A, we learn it eventually, or B, it really crushes us. And so, um, you know, I, I got a friend of mine that says he doesn't trust anybody who hasn't failed. Uh, especially in business, right? Uh, he, he doesn't fail. He doesn't trust anybody that hasn't failed because you do learn more from your failures than you do your successes, and um, and that's it's a really good teaching guide. So uh, I like role playing games in general because they can teach us. You know, we get a, we get really into our characters. We get kind of emotionally involved, um, and we get caught up in them. But then when something bad happens to them, which, you know, sometimes it happens, um, especially because maybe it was a dumb decision we made or something like that or a decision that wasn't optimal. Um, When something bad happens, you know, then, you know, it kind of affects us. It affects us. But again, it's not a real world, you know, equivalency bad thing that's happening to us. It's just happening to us in the game. And so when it's something that happens to you in the game, you can bounce back from that much easier, right? But hopefully you learned what it was you did. You messed up that time and go, okay, eh, I'm probably not going to try to make a deal with the Demi Lich next time, right? Yeah. Or whatever. So. so what's the craziest thing you've done, like, as one of your characters? In the, in the Man, that's a hard one. Um, I did a lot of stuff. Like I said, I've been playing since 1991. Right. And I've had a long, long LARP career, uh, you know, and I've played pretty steadily. There may be a, a year off, you know, COVID year off or something like that. But there's been times where I've been playing three LARPs in one month, you know, and three LARP weekends. Yeah, it's it get, I was pretty crazy there for a little while. Um now these days, I like one, you know, I I help run LARPs again, right? And then I like to play at least one LARP while I'm helping run a LARP. And that way, I think it's important for um, any storyteller, anybody who runs LARPs, it's important to go play at least one other LARP. And the reason why I say that is because, A, if you're running a LARP, chances are you're doing it because you love LARPing. Okay, and that you were a player first and started playing and you got really into it. And that kind of just you kind of progressed into LARP ownership okay, or running a LARP. So um, that's the first thing I would say is definitely play a LARP because you get you still have player perspective on things. 
things and you get that player's perspective. Because when you're sitting up and you're running things and you're storytelling, you have a 90,000 foot overview sometimes of what's going on down below with your players. And sometimes you're just not aware of the things that may, they may like or not like, or something along those lines, or, you know, you just, it's hard to have the player perspective sometimes when that's all you're doing is running. So that's the first thing I would say. Um, second, um, what's the, I think the craziest thing we, I ever did, the thing that always sticks out in my mind, I played this one LARP, uh, that was done by one of the local LARP owners here. Uh, his name is Salim Halibi. Right. And, uh, Salim ran a LARP called, uh, 1700. Right. And, um, it was kind of like a 1700s based where it was more like, a colonial sort of era, but it had magic and things along those lines. Okay. And I was with uh, a group of friends and we all served the magical order, right? Which was kind of, it's the kind of the equivalent of the Catholic church. And we were all inquisitors and uh, we were all um, trying to, there was this great, what we felt was evil that we needed to deal with, which were these things called spell witches. And they were very powerful, really crazy. Well, anyway, make a long story short, um, we found out that um, the head of our order, who was kind of like the Pope, all right, was being controlled by an outer planar creature, right? Um, you would you would say probably like, you know, if you looked at D&D or something like that, you'd say demonic entity sort of thing. And he had, uh, he was called the Lord of Failure. And he had controlled him. And we we had to get brought this evidence from this other group who we weren't really, really tight with, but we kind of were. They knew us and things had grown. Like at first they didn't like us and stuff like that because we were we represented the law. But they brought us the evidence and we couldn't dispute the evidence that, yeah, we think that this is the case. So we basically had a big showdown where um, – I had to go in and I was kind of leading. I had a bunch of people at my back, but he had a whole bunch of people in there and golems and everything else. And I, as the chief inquisitor, basically had to have it out with him. Okay. And I said, you'll submit yourself to interrogation. And he didn't like that. And he tried to strip me of my rank because I was a member of the order, right? He's technically, I mean, he is the boss. And I went, nope, that's not happening today. Right. And it finally got to a point where there was no talking. Like he had hit an impasse. I'd hit an impasse. We we're in this big, big room. And finally it was like, okay, it's on. And it started this huge fight and this whole fight takes place. And uh, it was crazy. It was really crazy. And I went in there. I remember telling everybody before we walked into that encounter that guys, this is the magical order. If they decide that we're traitorous or seditious, they could end all our care. They have the magic to end all our characters, right? And that was on the table before we walked in there. We knew if we went in there and we accused him and we couldn't prove it or we didn't have a way to stop it, that was probably it for our characters. So it was this incredible character defining moment where, all right, everybody, you know, pull up your pants. We got to go do this. And we did. And I gave a nice pep talk before we went in there. I gave everybody, it was really funny. I gave everybody, I said, guys, if we fail about what we're about to do, that's it for you. So I suggest if you don't want to be part of this to walk away right now, and I won't think any less of you, right? Because I'm asking you to put your lives on the line. And you know, Adam, you've played enough LARPs where you have multiple lives in LARPs and things like that. But in some LARPs, there are ways to get rid of characters permanently. True. Well, the people that we were doing this to had ways to get rid of characters permanently. And it would if we had failed, it, that's probably what would have happened. And so the fight starts, and it is brutal. And I, I get dropped pretty quickly in the fight. I, I got, I had a spell that I teleported over to the two next to him, and everybody concentrated on me while all my guys surged. And it turned into this big mass fight and everything like that. And it was brutal. And the fight lasted for I felt like an eternity. I got back up. Somebody healed me. Got me back up. He went running. And he ran out the building and we were at this uh, state park called Falls, uh, Fall Creek Falls, I think. Mm -hmm. 
that's up in Tennessee. It's like middle Tennessee. Okay. And uh, we were up at the, and they had uh, stairs and they had different levels in the buildings and things like that. It's oh, pretty boy. crazy. He was running up the stairs and running through the building and running outside. And he turned around and I was right behind him. And there was one person right behind me and he webbed me and I couldn't do anything about it. And I got webbed, but the person behind me, as the guy was basically rifting out, trying to get away, got the last hit on him and he dropped right and it was just by the skin of our teeth and after he dropped him we dropped the magic on him that that freed him from being controlled and as i'm laying on the ground because i'm just dying because i ran so much and this was such a emotional moment i'm laying there i'm on my back and he walks by me and he looks down at me he goes um inquisitor Cade, i'll let you keep your badge today and then walk off. I'm like, well, all right, you know, yeah. uh, that's great. <laughs> but that to me was um, that to me was one of the my all time highlights uh, as far as most memorable moments. I mean, I've had a lot of them. I've had tons and tons and tons. But that one is one that really sticks out to me because I guess the 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 stakes were so high. Right. We had so much to lose. And it, it tells me something when it comes to writing storylines and things like that, that sometimes players really want high stakes. And when you write those types of things into the story, you know, you've got to make sure everybody understands what it means if they fail or things like that. There's an expectation as a storyteller. You have to you have to set, you know, and um some friends of mine call it black trench coat. I'm not 100% sure why they call it black trench coat. But if it's a black trench coat encounter, it means it is a very high chance of bad things really happening to you if you fail in that encounter. And so that was most definitely a black trench coat encounter. But you don't see those too often because no. they, lose, they lose their value. They do, absolutely. You know, it's all about usually a culmination of things and that storyline what we had faced was a culmination of about they that had started at the beginning of the game okay and uh and that had been like three or four years before so that storyline had been running for about three or four years so um it was pretty crazy it was pretty crazy three or four years that storyline had been going and um uh, so it was a good, that was a really good culmination of that storyline. That's awesome. Um, so let me ask you this. So, all right. So that's kind of on the player side or you right. as a player. Mm -hmm. Um, now what would you say, you know, you've been playing for a long time about, would you say you spent maybe half your time playing the PC or three quarters of your time versus running? I know you've, you've written world development. You've obviously, you know, run tons of encounters i know that you did like a decade's worth of encounters that i've been you know um or storyline just you know with with you know one NPC, right um you know so i guess my first question is you know do you think you spent more time being a pc or 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 writing uh writing okay. these days definitely writing um yeah uh it didn't start out that way Right. Obviously, it started out being a PC and that's the way it should start out. Right. I mean, getting thrown into the storytelling side of LARPing, you, you got to kind of know how to LARP first because there's there's things that you might have that are just very grandiose sort of ideas, but they won't work in execution because you don't understand how the LARP mechanics sort of work. Right. Or what PCs are likely to do. A lot of uh, writing storylines is forecasting. OK, uh, just like, uh, you know, stockbrokers forecast and things like that, all that kind of stuff. It's kind of I mean, it's not the same exact thing, but it's understanding um, how human beings think. Right. And what your players are most likely to do. So when I write a storyline, um, I write these pivotal moments within the storyline that are all player agency moments. Uh, one of the things as we've gotten a lot more developed in our storytelling. And I say we as in the people I usually do this with. Um, one of the things that we have found is that the more player agency that you have, and player agency by people are not understanding what I'm saying when I say that, um, player agency is when uh, the players basically buy in, 
Okay, they feel like it's not just my storyline that I'm reading that they're that they're participating in. It's their storyline. Okay, the people who are participating in that storyline, they are all players and actors within that storyline. And just like if I had written a play and they were all acting out parts, the difference is it'd be more like a uh, kind of ad hoc thing they're doing. They're getting to um, to improvise. Right. As to what their care, what kind of decisions their characters would do based upon their characters. And so um, and as a storyteller, I'm just providing the vehicle for them to do that. OK, because I want more player buy in when players are engaged in your storyline. There's no better feeling in the world um, as a storyteller than having people really excited about your storylines, uh, having them engaged, having them care. Uh, you know, and, and, you know, and I'm going to be honest with you. Sometimes I've taken it too far. You know, I, I, we were, I had this one group that we were writing story that I was writing stories for. And, um, I was kind of like their plot person that ran their story stuff for them for their storyline. And, um, it got to such a degree that I, I had to have a meeting with them out of play at one point because they were telling me they were having nightmares out of play. Right. And I was like, okay, maybe I'm, maybe I went too far, right. With what I was doing to these poor PCs. Right. So, you know, I, you know, okay, let me rein it back in a little bit, everything like that. Maybe I'm, I'm providing a little bit too much of an intense, you know, people are here and they want more of a, you know, maybe a Bill and Ted's excellent adventure sort of story and not a, uh, you know, in the mouth of madness sort of story. Right. Sure. So, you know, sometimes you're sometimes PCs and you have to be cognizant of this is uh, certain PCs like certain types of stories and certain things to interact with. And you have to be careful when you are, when you're writing these sort of stories that you're targeting the right audience for that story. Right. So like a session zero for, for your encounters. Sure. Sure. Something sure. that people can go, yeah, this is something I want to pursue or not pursue. You know, at the end of the day, it's all about, and this is really, you can break it down to this. It's all about were the, were the players entertained or were they not entertained, mm -hmm. right? And entertainment comes in different forms, right? Causing an emotional reaction, right, within a player is a form of entertainment that takes place. Yes. Uh, having them care about it is – that's entertaining to them, right? Having them buy into it. And we've just noticed over the years that the more player agency that players have over the storyline, the better it is for, for them. OK, the more that they feel like they're a part of it, they're just not participating in somebody else's story. They're in their own sort of story. Right. And I think that's the best that's the best kind of storytelling. And it gets that gets hard to do when you are running a game that has over 75 people. You know, uh, when you have a larger numbers, you kind of have to scale back, especially the personalization of stories to some degree. OK, uh, so where the stories are not geared towards specific groups or people a lot of times because of there are um, because there's so many people that you're having to entertain in the game. So um, hopefully you're not the only person telling stories. <laughs> you know? right. hopefully, hopefully there's other people there and they're entertaining other people and things like that. And that's going on because at the end of the day, you know, it's a big difference from when I first started LARPs. Uh, stories that were kind of being told were kind of, okay, maybe five people kind of interacted with it, maybe 10 at most, mm -hmm. something along those lines. And that was it. That was all I was being run. And the rest of the game was running around. And because there wasn't anything to do really on a storyline level, on a, on a tell of them participating in the fantasy, right? They're going around killing each other. Right. And they're all hanging out in the woods waiting for other people to come walking by and they're jumping out and killing them and uh, and taking their loot. Right. Because they were bored. Right. And right. that's the one thing you really got to be careful about is you don't want to run a game where people are getting bored. You right. want you want play unless that's the purpose of the game. Some games I've seen run right. like that. And that was the whole purpose. But you're really going to cater towards one type of of person. Right. Uh, of one type of entertainment model right that they like versus what everybody kind of likes and the most successful LARPs that i've ever seen are the ones that cater towards not just you know the killer types right but also your socializers also your explorers also your achievers right um that's the best type of of game 
like um, that I I think and if you can cater towards those different play styles mm -hmm. um, then you're gonna run a pretty successful game as long mm -hmm. as you got volunteers that'll help you and you can deal with and there's always other things there's inherent drama things like that as long as you can weather some of the things that can kind of get you down as a storyteller or make it kind of want to tear i don't have any hair right i wonder why i probably torn it all out by this point right yeah. so uh as long as you can weather that sort of thing um and you all the other stuff is just kind of noise and you concentrate on the entertainment side of it um you're going to run a pretty good game Right. And uh, you got a good idea inside you and you want to get it out. and You want to tell that story and you want other people to participate in it and, and evolve that story from what you've kind of started. And then they take off and go with it. It's very rewarding when you see where it goes. You know? What was your favorite story to tell? Whew. Oh, that's a good one. Um, I've run some really good stories. Um, and I'm saying that. I know that sounds so arrogant and egotistical. Well, I mean, I'll, I'll agree with you because I've been on some of those stories and and I know the group you're referring to earlier. Um, I think that's part of that. I, I, I have to say I like – I really like redemption stories. Okay. okay. And I don't know why that is. It's just one of those things that I've always liked. I've run – intrigue based stories political intrigue i've run you know big bad monster if, if you're interested i'll tell you how i first started storytelling because right? i didn't i actually didn't think that i wasn't really on the storytelling page uh when i first started larps uh back in the early 90s um i wasn't really thinking about anything like storytelling or anything like that what i was thinking about was uh hey i want to go out there and throw some spells at some stuff and kill some monsters and get some loot and succeed and be cool. Right. And that was kind of my, my primary motivation. And um, it wasn't until I, I finally got, I'd read a lot of books, a lot of fantasy books, especially. And uh, I discovered forgotten realms. I discovered the Margaret Weiss and Tracy Hickman, Dragonlance books. And I really got into the real stories of them. And um, one day I, and I had been, I don't know. I must've been about 21, 22 at the time. And I, I wrote a bunch of ideas that I had for a story down in uh, a notebook. Okay. Uh, just a spiral bound with my horrible ass handwriting. And so uh, one of the people who uh, ran a game in Atlanta uh, had a comic book store. And uh, I had been visiting the comic book store with uh, some friends of mine and uh, I left and I didn't realize, but I had left my notebook okay. and they, he found the notebook and he started going through it. And then I get this phone call and he's like, Hey, um, I, I, you left your notebook in the store. And I was like, Oh my gosh. You know, and I totally forgotten it and everything. And he's like, Hey, I, I kind of read this and it's good. And I went, really? And he was like, yeah. He's like, can, can I use this? And I was like, um, okay you really want to use it and he was like yeah yeah i want to use this and i was like um sure right and so he took what i'd written and turned it into a, a big storyline and i started thinking about it after that and i was like i bet you i could write storylines and then somewhere around 1995 i think 96 somewhere around there i finally joined uh i think it was 95 i joined uh the plot committee with a bunch of other people that I knew and said, okay, you remember that? Yeah. And I said, I, I'm going to actually tell, and it was really funny because I had written up the background for this whole entire story and pass it out to all the other plot members at the plot meeting, my very first plot meeting, I'm sitting there thinking all these people. And then one of them called me that, you know, like a day later and said, Hey, I read this and this is cool. And this is really good. And I went, really? And he was like, yeah, which I mean, I'm going to be honest with you. I just didn't, I didn't have any confidence in anything that I ever wrote or anything like that, that anybody would like it. And, and he was like, yeah, man, this is really cool. And then I said, I know I'm on the phone with him for like nine hours. Like I kid you, I kid you not. And it's really funny because this is the person that you're going to have on as a guest next week. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so, uh, he, um, he uh, he loved it, and it turned out to be the big storyline of our plot committee, okay, and with all the events that took place in it and all the events that happened and everything like that. And after that, it was like, you know, and I, I spent about a year on plot in that game, and after that, I was like, you know, I could kind of do this. And then when another game had started up uh, and we went over to that, 
you know, I was kind of writing packets. I was writing lore information for the different um, uh, cultures and things like that, cultural packets, race packet type stuff. Wow. And uh, I was writing all that kind of stuff, trying to get more because there wasn't a lot of it in the game. You know, that wasn't really what people were concentrating on. And I knew it was important because that's where you get your best buy in at uh, mm -hmm. from the players. You know, a lot of people. Some people go out to large for different reasons. Some people go out because I just want to hang out with my friends. Sure. Some people go out because I want to dress up. You know, uh, sometimes it's a culmination of those things. Sometimes Some people, people go out with, other, with, with weapons. Yeah, yeah. Some people just want to go out and hit people with weapons, right? And be like, hey, it's not illegal for me to, to smack this guy with my sword, right? And everything <laughs> like that, you know, and get into some real combat. And they love the sport of it. There's different reasons why, why people play LARPs. But um, one of the reasons why – one of the things that I realized pretty early on was – and it is because I'm this way. You know, I wasn't originally, but I became this way where I love a good story and I love playing a character. And I love a good background on that character. And I love – you know, it's, it's kind of like, hey, Steve Rogers is this little wimpy guy right? Who can't do anything, but he's got a good heart. And he goes out there and he gets beat up all the time trying to help people or – do the right thing and everybody beats him up but then he gets this super serum and becomes somebody and then and then now he's got the body to match the heart that he does and he becomes captain america right well that's a good backstory right i like that backstory and i like creating good backstories like that with people and um so you know when you do that and people buy they have a lore packet to go off of or they have a world stuff to go off of the, all the information then they come up with good ideas for the characters and they buy in. And that's the whole point is the more you get people to buy in, the more those people are just become engaged with what you're trying to do. And that's the best compliment anybody could ever give you as a person who's a world designer, as a person who's a storyteller, any, anybody on that side of things, when people buy into what you're doing, that's the best absolute feeling in the world. It really is. So, um, yeah, I, uh, I, I did world development for this other LARP, and then um, I ended up starting to do storylines and plot for them and did that for a few years until I went – I did that actually for about half a year, close to a year. No, it was about a year. Uh, I I was just kind of like a part-time plot person, and then I went full-time. And I was full-time for four years, I think, maybe, uh, something like that, four or five years. It was, it was some number of years in there. And, yeah. um, you know, ended up – you know, we were doing world system turns in that game, the, in, in between game actions. We were writing. I wrote so much for that game. It's crazy. And, uh, but it helped bring it alive for people. And, and uh, I got a really good sense of, of reward for the stories because at the end of the day, to me, my, what I get out of alert is the stories right? Of what people did, of what I did, or what other people did. And I have great stories that are from me being a PC and I have great stories from me running encounters and what other people did. Right. And so, um, I, it can be, it, it can be just as rewarding on either side of things. I, I completely agree. In fact, let me ask you this. Um, have you ever gotten like a token or, or something sort of physical from an encounter or something that a NPC gave you, or maybe even a PC gave you that has just kind of been emotional something that, that just like, you know, is a good memory. Of, oh yeah. Of oh gosh. Yeah. Um, I mean, plenty of things. I, I mean, I had an adopted father in the first game I played and uh, he gave me his mithril sword before he went off to become a lich. And uh, that was a huge deal for me. I mean, I, I, I'm pretty funny about certain things. Right. And this is going to make you laugh. Right. This is one of my, <laughs> my, my deep long secrets here, but Anytime I've ever gotten a magic item in a game, a magic weapon or something like that, I always sleep with it in my bed, right? I don't know why. It's this weird thing that I do. But, you know, I slept with that damn sword for a while, right? Uh, like, had it just in the bed with me for some reason. I don't know why, but... It Is this wasn't outside like... of the game, too? I mean, inside the game, I get it. You're protecting yourself. Oh, no, no, no. Outside the game. <laughs> outside the game yeah i just it's laying over in bed with me i don't know why I, I mean the only thing i can think of is it's some sort of uh you know i'm trying to imprint upon it right and make sure. it mine kind of like attunement and D, &D sort of thing nice, I'm trying yeah. to attune the magic weapon to me sort of thing i don't know but yeah i'll do that but um yeah oh yeah i i gotta be honest i love giving things that mean stuff to people 
right? And that's one. Of, that's another really rewarding thing about being a storyteller is when I give out, you know, I just don't give out magic items, right? I just don't give out stuff for people to have or anything like that. It's I want people to earn it. And I want people to, when they earn it, they know they earned it, right? They know that they went through hell and back to get this, right? It just wasn't, oh, have some cool loot or whatever. No, I want it to mean something to someone when they get it. And so um, I love it when somebody gets an item I've put in the game and it means something to them and they love it. And that's like becomes part of their character. And so I'm, I'm real big about that actually. And, you know, it's a, you know, you can't do it too much. You got to do it the right times, but when the PCs need to be rewarded, definitely reward them. That's part of it. You know, that's part of the reason why they play. And when you get a reward like that for doing something really cool that you succeeded at, there's no better feelings in the world. It's just like, yes, I did this, you know, and I got this. And man, I'm going to tell you the truth. When you're young and something like that happens to you, it really impresses upon you. It really does. And it, it means something. And I... For me, being a storyteller, being a writer, it's not – I couldn't do what I do if I was just throwing something out there, right? There's always got to be a, a good lesson in it somewhere or meaning, okay? It's got to be something that helps people – you know, think like I said, told before about, you know, helping young people make good decisions and things like that. Um, I like to write stuff that people are impacted by when they walk away from it. And 20 years from now, right, when they're on their porch drinking a sweet tea or a beer, right, thinking about the good old days, hanging out with some friends, that might be a cool story that comes up. And it impacted them and it meant something to them. And maybe they learned something from that story. And if I can do that, man, I'm I'm doing what I was put on earth to do as far as I'm concerned. That's awesome. Um, so I, I actually, uh, just out of camera from you, I've got a bag of about a dozen different things I've gotten from uh, oh, okay. like the 26 years, whatever that I've been playing and, and stuff like that. So you know, sure. at some points I've accrued these, uh, accrued these things. But, um, you know, we've been talking for about an hour now. And okay. what I'd like to do is to ask you a couple of other kind of questions of like how LARPing has affected you like in real life or out okay. of the game. Sure. And then um, from there, maybe, you know, take a few more minutes and, and you know, kind of wrap it up uh, because I, you know, I do appreciate your time. Oh, but, yeah. And I'm going to be honest, I'm very verbose, so I can sit here and talk for hours. So, yeah, you have to cut me off at some point. No worries. <laughs> and so, um, so actually we did get a question here um so and we've been having people kind of popping in now so you know what let me actually take this time to ask this question um so this is actually <laughs> from my daughter oh okay. she said she asked you know what's your favorite type of character well personally me personally i like characters that have suffered a lot in their background and are overcoming those, um, again, redemptive arcs, right? Uh, I like characters that suffered and they're coming back and, uh, oh, that's fun. Uh, and they, um, and they, they overcome odds that, uh, you know, based upon their past experiences. So I tend to like personally like characters like that, but I'm going to be honest with you. I've played bad guys. I've played good guys. Uh, you know, when we did a 10 year anniversary in the old LARP that we played, I got voted best antagonist. The NPC that one of my NPCs got voted best antagonist. Oh, yeah, I know. Yeah. And you remember? And then the other for protagonist, I was the second, I was came in second place on the best protagonist. So, you know, I can go both ways. And I like, and I enjoy playing a good evil character, not a dumb evil character, right? This mustache twirly. I like playing a good evil character that you may not, you may not like what he does and his actions may be horrific even, but you at least understand where he's coming from. Right. And so that's the kind of characters I, the kind of bad guys I like to do. Uh, good guys. I like playing guys who are, who are the example for everybody else around them. Right. They just good people who try to do the right thing. And they may be flawed. They may have issues also because those are more interesting characters anyway. Flaws make characters more interesting. Okay. But but yeah, I, I like characters who 
yeah, they're this type of guy. They're kind of messed up. They do this. But at the end of the day, they're still going to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do. Okay. Absolutely. Awesome. Very cool. Um, so kind of moving on to kind of how uh, LARPing has affected you in real life. Um, um, you know, what skills has LARPing kind of helped you become more proficient at? Man, all across the board. Um, I was a clumsy, clumsy teenager, right? And uh, I would, I, I took martial arts to be better at that, to understand and how to use my left hand as well as my right. And right. that helped, it helped a lot. Mm-hmm. But I was still, I'm to this day, I'm naturally clumsy. It's really funny. I'll drop stuff, everything like that. But what I have today are these great reflexes that I'll catch stuff as I drop them and I'll do stuff. I like, I've got good recovery skills. And I think those reactions are based upon LARPs, right? When, when you're in the middle of a heated situation and you have less than a split second to react, you know, and you got to react the right way, you know, that's, you know, otherwise you're dead, you know, that, that trains you. Right. And, you know, I don't know if you know this or not, but at least this was true a little while ago. The GBI, the Georgia Bureau of Investigation, said that LARPers counted as combat trained. And so if you were to and that and that matters, because if you were to get in a fight with somebody and you kick their ass, well, you're supposed to show restraint because you're actually considered combat retrained, combat trained the same thing as being a martial artist or a black belt or something like that. You have superior skills in the person you're going up against, so you should show more restraint. Well, as a LARPer, just on the physical side, if somebody comes up and swings a baseball bat at me, I'm not going to panic, right? I'm not going to, I'm not going to crawl, crouch into a ball or anything like that. You know, I'm going to evade that and attempt to strike back, right? Because I feel like I am combat trained. So that's one aspect of it. Another is, um, just being situationally aware, right? Um, you know, I'm all the time, and I don't even realize I'm doing it. I walk into a, I walk into a, a, a restaurant, and the first thing my brain is doing unconsciously is threat assessment, right? And I'm looking to see where a potential threat is coming from. And it's weird. And, you know, and, you know, it's weird little things like don't sit with your back to the uh, to the to the opening of the store of the whatever you're in. Things like that. Yeah. Yeah. You're just situationally aware of what's going on around you. And and I I don't think that's a bad skill to have in this day and age, especially. Um, So on. So that's one thing. Uh, Better decision making, critical decisions. I make decisions very quick now. Right. Very quick brain decisions that being in certain situations, I just know what to do, right? It's really weird. And it's, it's, it's the same reason why police officers, why army people, why, why, you know, special ops, things like that. They train and they train and they train and they train. So they know how to react in certain situations. Well, LARPing, sometimes it's not like completely like that stuff, but it does give you a little bit of that, right? To where, okay, if somebody comes in and they're, they're intent on doing harm or something like that, I know how to react in that situation. Um, I'm also really good at talking people down. Right. When people get upset or angry or something along those lines, my social interactions got so much better. And I would say for a lot of people who are LARPers, that's one of the main benefits you can get from LARPing is how to talk to people in different situations. Right. And, and, you know, if it's an aggressive situation towards you, how to calm that person down. I have talked my way out of potential death. Right. Because, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, I was in a situation and, I didn't know what this person was, but this person was a special ops person, right? And he had a moment where he freaked out and flipped out on me. And I, if I had come back at him aggressively, I was probably dead, right? No ifs, ands, or buts about it. I'm not, I'm, this is not hyperbole or anything like that. I'm 100%, this would have happened. And I just, my instincts all kicked in at the same time. I went, whoa, it's cool, man. It's cool. And he went, he stopped and got this weird look on his face like, is it cool? And I was like, it's cool. I knew to call him by his name because I knew him. I was like, call it's cool, man. It's cool. And he was like, okay. And he kind of get this weird look on his face like he's ready to go. And he went, but you're saying it's cool. And I went, it's cool. And he was like, okay. And kind of got this weird look on his face and walked away. It's cool. The guy didn't remember any of that the next day. Wow. Yeah, yeah. That's how. And this guy was a person who was consistently being called away from my work to go over to Iraq right during the whole iraq thing and he, he flip-flopped back between my work and going out to iraq as an operator 
Okay. And okay. so I know for a fact that if I come back at him, I probably would have gotten like, he would have done something really bad to me. And, um, but I didn't, my instincts all screamed at me going, wait, something's wrong here. This guy is coming at you super aggressively for almost no reason at all. He's flipped. This is not, and, and, and that's all, that's all kind of what LARPing kind of does for you. It kind of gives you this whole, you know what? I, I think you think about these sorts of things and you're like, am I going to combat this aggressively or what, what, what's the best way to approach this? And it was definitely not aggressive with that guy. Thank goodness. So I've learned a lot from LARPing. I've learned a lot from LARPing. As a matter of fact, my, the person you're going to have next week wants to write a book at some point called everything I need to know about life. I learned from LARPing. I mean, that makes sense. Uh, I mean, that's definitely, I think um, a good book. Right. Um, yeah, or, or, or I definitely can see that. Um, and, and we'll announce who that'll be uh, just here shortly. Um, let me ask you this. Where do you think LARPing is going to go in the next you know, three to five years? Well, I think a lot of that depends on uh, COVID, right? Sure. Um, COVID has put a huge dent into the LARPing activities, obviously. And uh, just when we thought, okay, we're coming out of it and we're getting – then Omicron hit, and that spread a lot faster than any of the other ones did. Now, it's less detrimental, but people still don't want to get it, right? right. And so because of that – um, you know, there's, there's a lot of, on the, on the ownership side, there's conversations about, do you, do we have to require people to be vaccinated or not? You know, if they come to a LARP, you know, just all kind of, do we make people wear masks at a LARP? You know, there's all these things that COVID has introduced that is really makes LARPing really hard. And some LARPs are, I mean, some LARPs have started back up. Right. And they're moving forward and some other ones still have not got on board yet. And even the one that I'm involved with from a um, ownership side, we we've we've taken steps, but we're not quite there yet to where we're ready to run an event yet. You know, and once once I think people feel like it's a safer environment, that'll start happening. Um, well, let me ask you this, just because to put COVID aside, because, you know, there's all different thoughts on that and trying to kind of pull away from kind of that type of thing like have you seen other things that have happened you know i guess maybe even two years ago before the covid thing that was leading to new technology or thoughts or or concepts um you know, definitely with- there's definitely some really new things we're getting more automated right and um LARPing, even sci-fi LARPs have been, which I've done those two, have been a low technology sort of thing, right? Where we're barely, because LARPs, let's be honest, there's not a lot of money that's usually put into LARPs, okay? And because there's a limited budget on that, um, you don't see much of a technical, um, a, a lot of use of technology in LARPs, right? That's starting to change, I think, as some of the technologies get cheaper to use. Uh, I've noticed there's some hit location systems out there where sensors and things like that that I've, I've just been looking at. Uh, so that's potentiality. Uh, we've talked about that in the past, but they're becoming more affordable, right? So maybe something along those lines could be something that happens. Um, you I know, an article not too long ago that somehow, like, people's cell phones would be able to tell uh like damage taken somehow oh yeah um, yeah yeah i mean, I mean with I mean, the hip location that you're referring to all that all that kind of stuff right all that kind of stuff and um you know as the technology gets better it'll get easier to do it the thing is is um you know ge- generations are different right and you have i come from a generation gen x that's um we were very pretty much rub some dirt on it and keep going no matter what it was, whether it was emotional, whether it was uh, physical, yeah. um, you know, that's just kind of my generation. Right. Um, and as a LAR- person who runs LARPs, a person who runs stories, I have to accept the fact that not all generations are like that. Right. And that I can write for an older generation that most people probably aren't even LARPing anymore, or I can adapt with the times and write, write uh, stories and things like that that are going to be good for y- uh, younger generations to be able to interact with also. So, one of the big challenges today in the LARPing community is finding what those thresholds are and trying to be cognizant of. Um, you know, people's, you have to take a lot of feelings and things like that into effect. You know, if, if you're going to run a LARP, you got to appeal to people, 
right? And if you want to appeal to people, that means you got to kind of try to speak the language that they're speaking. And there's some different, different generations have different languages sometimes. So it's a matter of kind of um, deciphering what it is that those people are saying. Okay, and going, okay, this is how we need to adapt, or this is kind of what we need to do, but still maintain the integrity of what I'm creating, okay, of what I'm trying to do with uh, this. So there's a balance that has to be found there. And that's kind of, it's kind of where we're at this day and age is trying to find that balance. So that's uh, on that. And that's not as much of a technology thing as that's more of an emotional side when it comes to LARPing, how to appeal to people who who would LARP in this day and age, right? Who want to think about LARPing and things like that in the future. Um, you've got to, you've got to have some, you got to be more cognizant than we were in the past of certain things. That's for definitely sure. Sure. Well, and that kind of leads into my other or next question, which is, and I think you kind of answered part of it is, you know, how do we bring more people into LARPing? Yeah. I mean, so the cool thing is, is that, LARPing, there's always going to be appeal to LARPing, I think, because it's something you do, right? It's not, it's something you, you have to go do. Uh, you have to leave your house. You have to um, buy the costuming or set up, make the costuming. Uh, you get to play dress up, things like that. So there's an appeal there that will always appeal to some people, right, regardless. Uh, so there's that. But I think you also have to make sure that and this wasn't done in the past as well as it, as it should have been. People have got to understand that LARPing is safe. Okay. And what I mean by that is not just from a physical standpoint, like, you know, we're, we're, we're safety conscious in that regard, but we're also safety conscious on the emotional side of things. Okay. We're also safety conscious on the, um, uh, on the situational side of things so that when you come out here, you know, yeah, maybe something you may not like might happen to your character, but that's okay. That's part of a story thing, especially based upon decisions that your character makes. Sometimes your character might, you may put your character in a bad situation. That kind of stuff can happen and that's okay. But no one here wants to punish you. No one here wants to make you feel bad. Uh, it's not just a boys club. There's lots of women that do this, um, you know, and it's safe on as many of the levels as we can make it safe on. Right. Besides just, you know, you know, sink or swim sort of mentality that we kind of had in the old days. We're, we're a lot more aware of 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 certain and I hate to use the word triggers and things like that, but because uh, I'm not trying to get too much into that space, right. but you're dealing with people and there's all kinds of different people. And so therefore you want to appeal to a mass amount of people as opposed to just a very specific small branch of people. Yeah. Uh, if you want to be successful as a LARP, you want to keep running it because I mean, let's be honest, LARPs don't make an incredible ton of money. Right. And that being the case, okay. cost gets put on the people who are the owners and things like that. And anybody who owns a LARP is usually not doing it for money. Anyway, they're doing it because it's a labor of love and they love LARPing. That's me. You know, I love LARPing. I've loved, it's been a hobby I've been doing, like I said, since 1991. So, um, but I want to, I guess if I had to sit there and tell a younger generation, what are the benefits of coming out here? I'm going to attempt to tell, have you participate in a story that you can help make decisions on with other people, right? That will mean something to you and give you a meaningful experience. I want to give you a meaningful experience. And that's kind of my goal, right? And to do it in a safe manner, okay? Where you don't have to worry about certain things. And that's that's probably the best way I can, I can tell, I can say to the younger generations. But my goal is hopefully you'll also learn something out of it. Very cool. Um, now, is there any advice that you'd give to a new LARPer? I know we covered maybe one or two things towards the beginning, but um, any anything else that you would suggest? Like, just for me, just one thing I would just say offhand, real quick, and and that's really about you. But um, if you get a chance, go to the site when when there's still light, so uh -huh. you <laughs> can walk around and kind of understand where you are. If it gets dark right. quickly and you're running around, I know my first event, uh, I was all over the place and almost right. my way back. 
It's always good to go monster first. Definitely, that's a, one of the first things. Find some friends who are involved in LARPing. Talk to some people on the boards, on, on whatever uh, social media platform that they're located on. Uh, most people are really nice, okay? Uh, and most people are willing to help because, you know, new blood is the, the life of the, of the LARP, right? You want to always get new blood in. And so people want new people there, and they want to be able to um, – to, to have them come out. And so uh, just uh, engage, ask questions. And I always suggest people should monster first. Sounds good. Um, so Sean, I, I appreciate all of your time. Um, <coughs> excuse me. Um, we've now been talking for a little bit over an hour and 20 minutes. Mm -hmm. um, and so, but you know, it's, it's all very natural. Um, is there any, you know, projects that you want to kind of give a shout out to or anything like just, uh, just our, you know, I'm currently working on uh, Legends Apotheosis, okay, and that's a, a LARP that I've uh, that uh, I've been working with uh, some other people. My owner, a fellow owners, Chris Dotson, is uh, the producer of it, and uh, I think he's going to be your guest next week. Yeah. And um, you know, we are we're trying to do some things that we have we don't think anybody's ever done in a LARP. And so and when it comes to appealing, especially when it comes to appealing to different play styles, we want to try to appeal to all the different play styles so um, that we've identified these are play styles. So, yeah, um, Legends Apotheosis, I think you can check us out at www.legends, that's L-E-G-Y-N-D-S, gaming.com, I believe is the website. And, um, you know, check it out. And if you're interested, uh, you know, we hopefully will start having uh, events at least by the end of the year, right? Sometime soon, summer, end of year, all depending on how the COVID thing is working out. But um, we are we are definitely running uh, events. And we had a really good um, one-day playtest sort of thing that just happened recently. And uh, we're really excited. And we think people are really excited also to try it out. Absolutely. Um, so uh, as, as Sean was kind of uh, alluding to, um, next week we uh, have – uh, Chris Dotson, uh, who Sean just mentioned is the producer uh, for Legends Apotheosis, uh, who will be us. Um, and just to also name a few other uh, people that we've spoken to that said that they're interested in um, coming on the show. We actually have uh, dates. I, I just want to double check before I put everyone else down, but uh gentleman by the name of Brian Dow, who now um, plays uh, Awakening, yep. he also... Um, he uh, creates very weapons. respected LARP runner. I don't actually think I've ever, I may have, I may have met Brian in the old days, right. uh, but uh, not when he started running LARPs, but I hear a lot of really great things about Brian. Right. So when I actually started playing, I was playing a lot with Brian and Brian's a great guy. Um, unfortunately we've kind of fallen out of touch, but I think that's one of the great things with LARPing is that even though we haven't, we can still kind of come back like 10, 15, yep. 20 years later and just talk. And, you know, I definitely have some, you know, good. It's memories. always that thing that unites. <laughs> Exactly. And that's why, you know, why I wanted to actually kind of do this whole broadcast and this type of thing is because LARPing has been such an amazing experience that I've been a part of. And I know, you know, obviously the same for you. Yep. And, you know, we want to give, you know, people just to have those experiences, you know, um, you know, feel free to, you know, please check out, you know, um, Legends as, as uh, Sean mentioned, but, you know, there are different games, different genres, you know, find what's, you know, um, best for you that's going to, you know, you know, kind of work with your play style. There, there are different types of uh, bars, but um, you know, so we definitely want to, you know, encourage people to come check it out. Um, they're, they're definitely a lot of fun. Um, so, but yeah, anyway, going back. So next week we do have Chris Dotson that will be joining us. Um, we have. Well, if you think Dad. I'm verbose. <laughs> so, and Chris Dotson also comes to us on um, a different level. As Sean mentioned, kind of this the world system turns that they were doing. Um, well, Chris is a game designer. Right. And, uh, Go ahead. Yeah, he's a, he's a game designer. He's also a professor at SCAD University and teaches narrative design. So he actually, you know, I go by a lot of experience. Chris has been formally trained in a lot of things. So he brings a very expert opinion to a lot. And him and I tend to align on most things when it comes to this. Mm -hmm. um, uh, also, so I believe Brian Dow is, I believe is scheduled for February. So again, we're looking to run these Tuesday nights at nine o'clock, a little bit after People might have to, you know, if they've got kids, maybe they can, you know, still stay up and watch this, that sort of thing. Um, and uh, we also have uh, Debbie Rickerson Pass, mm. if you're familiar with her. Um, she's an amazing storyteller. She's yep. an amazing artist as well. She, like, makes children's books uh, sometimes with us. So she's she's stuff. ridiculously good. Mm. Ridiculously talented. Exactly. And so, you know, 
um, you know, we're going to kind of try this out for a little while and uh, see how well it goes. If you guys are interested in uh, the chat, I just put a link uh, that might be a little tough. Um, and uh, it's going to try and see if we can get a little bit of feedback from people on uh, what they thought of how this went. Sure. Um, but, uh, you know, at the same time, you know, I, again, I just want to, you know, thank Sean for kind of being the guinea pig. Absolutely. Um, it was great hearing all these stories. Thanks. I had a great time. Awesome. Uh, and, and I'm so glad to hear that. Um, you know, and so, you know, if you guys need anything, please, you know, feel free to reach out to us. Um, you can also find us at, uh, you can email us uh, at info at lfgnexus.com. Um, we'll take this and we'll have a replay available in there. Um, it still might be able to be on some of our, our Twitch or, or um, YouTube live areas. So that, you know, uh, we hope other people uh, will be able to come and kind of um, come back and see this in the future um, and, uh, you know, get something out of it. And, you know, we hope you guys will give it a shot. Awesome. Well, hey, thanks for having me. Thank you. All right. Thank you, Sean. All right. Um, gentlemen, uh, ladies and gentlemen, thank you for your time. I appreciate everything. Um, but so if you need anything, also check us out on lgnexus.com. We are, again, a social media platform built and designed with gamers in mind. Have a great night, and we will see you uh, next Tuesday at 9 o'clock with Mr. Chris Dotson. Take care.